Chris Roebuck is with us, visiting professor of transformational leadership at the Cass Business School. Good to see you this morning. Thanks. And what a timely moment to talk about companies in change and yes. how they manage change and restructuring. Yep. Just, um, just give us a click box here. Do you think John McFarlane is going about this in the right way? Coming in, telling everybody things are bad, but really rolling his sleeves up, getting to work and taking out layers. If you look at any organisation that's going to become world class from where it currently is, it needs to do three key things, which is direction, efficiency and effort. In terms of the direction, that is, are we concentrating on where we make the money? In terms of efficiency, are we running an efficient machine that delivers that efficiently? And thirdly, are we actually maximizing the effort of our people? Now, the problem is that for CEOs or chairmen, yes, you can control one. Yes, you can control two in terms of creating an efficient machine, which is what he's trying to do. But as he made the point, that final element, are you getting maximum effort from your people? That is something that the chief executive and board cannot do personally. They have to do that by inspiring leaders at all levels in the organization to inspire their people. You know, we know that in most organizations, roughly 60 to 70 percent of people are underperforming by between 10 and 30 percent because they are not getting the leadership they need to inspire them. More like five percent at CNBC, to be honest, Chris. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, I was just going to say, but, but, <laughs> but what's the what's the secret? You know, when when you come in as a CEO and you're yep. going to sack people and you're going to sell off non-core assets, which is what he's mm -hmm. doing here, how do you then get the people that are left behind to perform better? Because they're looking at it, going, shoot, I might be the next one who's thrown out here, yep. why do I want to work any harder for this business or for this manager? And that's the big challenge. And it's not actually to say everything previously was horribly wrong. The secret in these situations is to say, to be perfectly honest, you know, this organization has got a great history. It's got a great legacy and things have changed. The key point to make, and this is the point that works, which is not everything in the past was wrong, is look, we were great a few years ago when we fitted the market everything matched what we had to do matched our clients the world has moved on and the problem is that we haven't moved on with the world <clears throat> and now is the point that we have to catch up with the world and there may be a little bit of pain but the key point is in delivering that pain we will act with decency and integrity and that we will make sure that there is a compelling vision of the future that people sign up to. The point about the future is absolutely critical. You know, we know that an employee, before they give high performance, before they're prepared to change, does a cost-benefit analysis in their head, which is what do these people want me to do, why do they want me to do it, and what's in it for me? And interestingly, 57% of that equation is rational, but 43% is emotional. So unless the leadership can create an inspiring vision of the future, you won't get that maximum performance. But the chief executive can't do that. The funny thing is that 80% of that is down to the individual's boss. Because as we know, people join organizations and leave bosses. Mm -hmm. So what John has got to do is John has got to cascade that inspiring vision down the organization so line managers everywhere can inspire their people. It's that simple. It's really basic human psychology. I wonder sometimes if leaders try and push for too much change. And I reference this to what Aviva is yep. doing with a US business. Uh, there's been a lot of griping yep. saying that they've written down the goodwill of this business. It looks like they're just going to sell it off at a loss. And one investor was saying, well, new management was brought in to, to change this business, not to try and sell it at a loss and just, you yep. know, cut off assets. Is this a risk when new leaders come in? They take the ax and they cut off revenue streams that could actually be performers for the business down the track? Yes. And it depends what their cost benefit is it you know is the effort really worth it in terms of the time that we've got because there's a time element in it which is we need to concentrate on the critical stuff we don't have time to concentrate on the stuff that might not be critical but when wielding the axe one of the key mistakes that organizations make is to do a sort of blanket headcount cut everybody loses 10 percent bang thank you sorted well that's wrong completely and utterly wrong because you don't know whether you're getting the right people in that 10 percent you don't know whether you're getting the right businesses so 
wielding the axe in a very generic way is actually counterproductive because a number of organizations have found that they've wielded the axe too much but how do you get and six this? months because the problem with this is that the investment banks respond they see they cut to the costs on the balance sheet yep. they like that tick, tick tick the stock price goes up the the CEO looks like a hero or the chairman in this case yeah and, and that's exactly it we know we know that if a CEO comes in and wields the axe and boosts the amount of money that effectively the market loves to see even if that is potentially committing the organization to dropping over a precipice in five years time for various reasons that if you think about that emotional element if people get pushed too much if people get forced into a position that they're not happy with mm. they will leave but they will not leave immediately and there will be over a period of years a drip 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 of loss of the people you need to make the business successful sure. in the future and that drip 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 for example you know, NEDs NEDs should have the capability to say to the chief executive hang on if we look at these figures we're losing talent but for example in terms of NED development and NED education that area is not covered at I all I think what your acronym was then for a minute non-executive director sorry my apologies no no, no that's all right it's a bit, a bit technical baseball. No, 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 I got there eventually. I'm sure I've used it as well. Uh, Mikola, are you looking for the same things in a company and in a management team, as Chris just pointed out? Well, I think, though, you know, the things that you're saying, Chris, they, they are very important things, and I would agree with you, and I think very few people would disagree with you. I think the key point you're making is how difficult it is to turn what sounds very good on paper Absolutely. into practice. And, and I think that's where the real challenge lies. Yeah. Now, it's interesting, I was reading an article last night coming back on an airplane, mm -hmm. and it was telling me that um, if someone from the 1950s dropped into an organization today, yeah. he would find it very little changed. Yeah. And I thought that was very interesting. Have we really not developed our organizations more over the past 60, 70 years? Are we not getting better at this? I'd be keen to hear your views. It's really interesting that to some degree organizations have changed dramatically in terms of the pressure people are under, the fact that management has been significantly delayered, uh, and if you look at what John's done, uh, and one of the challenges that organizations now face in terms of leadership and getting commitment from employees is that the delayering of management in the 70s and 80s meant that line managers were presented with a choice. Either you concentrate on the stuff you're paid for, the stuff you are uh, appraised on, and then you've got this other stuff which is about developing people, developing their performance, but, but, but I mean and that's been cut. And that's the problem, that modern organizations are focusing on the short term, not the longer term stuff that's critical to sustainable But when you look at the companies that are young, that have come yeah. between the 1970s and now, the, the brilliant inspirational companies that at various times have, lead, have led, mm -hmm. the Microsofts, the Googles, the yep. Facebooks, um, it's all about their progression to being grown up, to being yes. kind of boring with the same old boardrooms, with the same old NEDs, as you say, yeah, the yeah, same yeah. old structures, then rather than those big old titans learning from the dynamis dynamicism uh, of those smaller companies. Ah, well, that's where organizations are going wrong, from my perspective, mm. in that what they need to do is they need to retain those core themes of entrepreneurialism and keep it operating in a corporate world. A and that's why I talk to organizations about the concept of entrepreneurial leadership. Because if you look at what entrepreneurs do in terms of, for example, optimizing risk not minimizing risk which is what big corporates do in terms of people taking personal responsibility as if it was their own business in terms of creating innovation and creativity to constantly improve customer service that's what an entrepreneur has to do to survive once organizations get big they lose that it goes out the window and the connection with the customer vanishes and I think that in terms of organizations in the 21st century, those organizations that do well are the ones that retain that organizational ethos of the entrepreneur within the corporate world. We've covered a lot here, but I want to get to your crisis strategy because mm -hmm. no doubt you're speaking to a lot of corporates right now. Mm -hmm. I see so much noise that's playing out across the periphery and wondering just, you know, how to work this strategy. What's your number one message that you tell a CEOs in terms of getting through this and positioning their company? One, don't overcomplicate it because we know that organizations are underperforming by 10 to 20 percent because they're more complicated than they need to be Two, keep that simple and focus on leadership that inspires people and keep the messages simple one of the things I've done in, in a previous organization with UBS was we had three key messages for all leaders which are leverage the whole organization deliver world-class client service and be a world-class leader and just do those things every single day 
and we'll be okay. And if it's, you can inspire and keep it simple, it will work because people will support you from the bottom upwards. Just a quick, quick one, um, very small. Um, they have a bureaucracy button, which mm. is something that John brought in, and you press this button, and yep. it's like a suggestions box, yes. if you like. Um, it, it, the track record of suggestions boxes is, is a little checkered, and usually the first thing that falls in there is a suggestion not to have a suggestion box. Indeed. Do they work at all? No. No. Suggestion boxes Fine. don't work. The best way to do it is every single team should have a weekly team meeting that is a two-way process. So the line manager says, this is what's happening, this is where we are going, because employees understanding that can improve performance by 30%. And for employees to be able to say, in an open environment, I have an idea how we could do things better. And that that gets upwards to the point at which it can be made to happen. Uh, and that's the secret of success. Chris, thanks so much for coming in. Uh, Chris you. Roebuck joining us um, with uh, some thoughts on how companies should reorganize their structures. He comes to us from the CAS Business School.